Hi everyone, I'm Sterling. Uh, I'm with uh, Runtime. Uh, Runtime is a company that I co-founded. I'm the CTO of Runtime. Uh, and our goal is to make open source uh, software for embedded microcontrollers. So when I say a bootloader for embedded, it's really kind of a class of devices that are, are sub-embedded devices. So uh, think Cortex-M style devices, constrained devices with tiny little flashes and, and very little memory. And Runtime uh, was founded with the idea of making software development modern, uh, modern and easy for these devices. Um, and so just a little bit about my, my background before I get started. Uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about the Minute Bootloader here, uh, which has recently been refactored into a project called MCU Boot. Uh, and so I'll give you a little bit of that history. Uh, but prior to that, just a little bit of my background. Uh, so. I was an early, I guess I got started at 13. Uh, I got started making websites. Uh, I was found open source through the PHP project, was a core contributor to the PHP project. And I, as I said on my previous talk, then, then Java started to take over the world and I decided that it was a time to find a, risk, a safe port in the storm. Uh, and so I wor started working on embedded with a company named Silver Spring Networks. Uh, and I, I, I started working very basically there and then ended up running the firmware team. At SilverSpring, uh, we shipped uh, 23, 24 million connected devices. We shipped those devices uh, onto the utility grid and in, in, in cities. And every single one of those devices had a secure bootloader, which we had developed and, and, and managed over time. And we, we did that over multiple iterations of chips, from our first ones, which were just simple at megas, to ARM 7s to our own custom system on chips, which had secure elements within them and had keys and key protection. Um, we, we, we developed that, and we, we regularly did software updates to 24 million devices, and we, do, we did that securely, and we ran, run large swaths of the power grid. Uh, uh, after that, uh, founded Runtime, which I just gave a bit of an overview of. And so this project is about the bootloader in the Apache Minute project. Uh, and, and here's a little bit of background on it. So uh, Runtime uh, was one of the original uh, members and contributors to the Apache Minute project. The idea behind P Apache Minute is it's really an operating system for connected devices and not an operating system in it, that you would think of as a traditional, just a kernel like UCOS or something like that, but an encompassing op operating system that includes bootloaders, networking stacks, file systems, everything that you would need to develop a connected product and all open source and Apache licensed. Uh, and so a, a, a part of that was to make the system software upgradable, right? Uh, everybody who develops a connected device, the one thing that everybody wants to do is upgrade software on that device. And so we, within the Apache Night Minute project, we actually include libraries to do software upgrades, uh, and those run in the application image itself, along with a secure bootloader. And so we were happily working along there, and then Zephyr launched. And so we've been talking for a number of months uh, with the Zephyr project and the members of the Zephyr project. Uh, Ricardo actually is here and, and Linaro. Uh, and we, so we decided to, to break the bootloader itself out of Minute because fundamentally a bootloader should work across multiple operating systems and create a separate project called MCU boot. Uh, so it's, right now it's hosted by runtime. Uh, it's github.com slash mcu runtime co slash mcu boot. Uh, and we've, we now can, with mcu boot, boot both minute images and Zephyr images. So if you come to the runtime booth, uh, which is just upstairs, a very quick product plug, we can actually show you our cloud being able to upgrade a minute device and have it swap to a Zephyr device and back and forth. And so this talk is about um, and Linaro has actually demonstrated this same bootloader at Linaro Connect, where they did software upgrades on Zephyr as well. So, so both of us have actually used this bootloader. Uh, from a runtime perspective, we've been using this bootloader for about six months on every single check-in and every single pull request to all of our development. We rebuild our entire system, and we use this bootloader to upgrade devices and run our unit test suite on it. So it runs pretty reliably. Um, and so I'm just going to talk a little bit about the bootloader. Uh, this is the flash layout slide, but really the idea behind the bootloader is to make it very, very small and secure for small embedded systems. So the type of processors that we run on are things like the Nordic NRF51, which have 16K of RAM and 128K of flash. So they're very, very small embedded devices. 
they, they grow in size. So, you know, some of them will have four megs of RAM and eight megs of flash, but that typically is where it tops out. Uh, what, if it gets any bigger, people tend to run Linux and other things on them. Uh, I think, you know, at Silver Spring, we ran up to 32 megs of RAM and 64K, 64 megs of flash, but that was mainly because we had an entire product suite uh, that had much lower end systems as well as higher end systems, and we wanted a single development uh, tree for all of it. But it's really designed to fit within a small code for footprint. So the bootloader itself fits within 12K of code. Uh, the, the significance here is you're kind of at this level, really looking at either 8K or 16K that you want to fit into. If you're any bigger than that, then it's just craziness. And the reason why you want to fit within 16K is that typically a bootloader itself needs to be write protected. And so if you look at the flash, you, you can adjust where the write protect is set on the flash. If you go to 17K, then you have to write, write protect at 32K typically. If you go uh, above 32K, you have to write protect typically at 64K. So fitting within 12K of code size is really good. We can grow up to about 16K. Uh, one of the reasons we, we keep the bootloader itself within 12K of code is we have a serial boot option with Minute. So the bootloader plus serial boot fits within 16K of code on these systems, which is fairly important. So if you look at the flat, in addition to the bootloader itself, what we've talked about uh, with, with the members of Zephyr is that also defining the actual layout of flash systems for these small embedded devices. Right? When you look at, if you looked at what we did in, or what I've done in previous companies, what it ends up happening is everybody ends up having their own flash layout for these devices and their own bootloaders. So Silver Spring had our own bootloader. We also had our own flash layout. And when you do that, it becomes very hard to manage these devices in the field and upgrade them over time. How do you, for example, create a running image and know what, what sectors are on that device? There is no concept of a super block for these embedded systems, right? So how do you define the layout of a system and how do you understand that is a part of the MCU boot project and, and both operating systems are collaborating on this project to do that. Uh, so what we have here in the flash layout is we have the bootloader itself and I'm trying to, oh, perfect. We have the bootloader itself uh, that typically sits, uh, depending on how you configure your flash, that can either be at the very end of flash where, for systems that boot that way or it can be at the very beginning of flash. Typically it's at the very beginning of flash. There's then a super block which defines the layout of the flash itself. So what it says is essentially this flash is a certain size and here are the blocks on that flash. We are going to allocate blocks 10 through 26 for image one, uh, 26 through 45 for image two. There's going to be a file system at 45 through 60. And so the super block basically gives you the layout of flash so that any application or kernel image that runs can read that super block information and understand how the flash is laid out itself. You then have two image slots. These slots, you can, you can only have one image slot if you only want to have one upgradable image, but there's always two slots. Essentially what you do is if, if you want, want to have only one slot, you just make the second slot really, really small. And so images, it, slot zero is the primary image slot. So the initial design of the bootloader is for systems that actually have internal flashes and run out of that internal flash. And so when you actually run on one of these systems, you don't want to have to have uh, compile your code in a position independent fashion. So you always want your image to be able to run from the same location. So slot zero in our bootloader is the primary uh, image location. Code always runs from there. And then slot one is the upgrade slot that you copy into. And if an upgrade is needed, the bootloader swaps the, the slots. And it swaps those slots using the scratch sector. So the scratch sector needs to be the, si the size of at least uh, one flash sector so that you can do a safe copy of the two swaps across power cycles, right? Because you can't assume that these devices will always be constantly powered. You may get interruptions uh, while you're doing an image upgrade. So essentially what you have is, is slot zero sits there and when you tell the image to do an upgrade, the bootloader will look at that and it will start swapping slot one into slot zero and it will use the scratch slot as it erases uh, sectors of flash in, sl in, in slot zero and replaces them with the contents of slot one. So the bootloader runs a swap and an image tra trailer tracks actually the state of swapping and upgrading the device. Uh, the bootloader itself, when it looks at these images, it supports either RSA or ECC DSA for signatures on the images itself. 
And so if you look at the actual image, essentially in the bootloader itself, what we have is an image header. Uh, that image header contains the size and version information for that image. Um, so it's a simple header. Uh, typically, there's also uh, some room for padding. So if you want to be able to locate interrupt vectors in text and you want to locate them at a specific location in text, there is a padding in the image header uh, itself. You then have the code that's associated with the running image, so the kernel. And then you have a set of TLVs that in include things like a, the signature of the image data itself. So the, the, the image header does not contain that signature, but the signature itself is contained within the TLVs. And then you contain the image trailer, which keeps an ongoing record of how the swap is going when, when it swaps between slot zero and slot one. And that's what those image trailers end up doing. So the, boot, the way the bootloader works and the boot process is, so, so the assumption here is, is that the bootloader is not actually managing the software upgrade itself. Uh, there's one caveat to that, but typically what you're gonna have is you're gonna have slot zero and slot one on your system. And the kernel itself is going to be linked with an image upgrade process. So it, you know, it's gonna be a preemptive, in Minute it's a preemptive task that runs, it, it's the same in Zephyr. And, and what, we, what we've done is we've implemented an image upgrade protocol that runs over OIC in Minute, and you can download a new image. When you download that image, you download it to slot one, and you can then tell the system to boot to the new image, and you can have a, a confirmation system based upon that. And that's all done within the application running code itself. That's not done within the bootloader. The bootloader just gets information from the operating system kernel about what image it should be running, and it tells it to do the swap. So what, what happens is on boot, the bootloader checks both slots. It normally boots slot zero. It verifies the signature of the image. So it does a SHA-256 of the image. And then it verifies the cryptographic signature of that image prior to booting it. And then it looks in, in, in if a new image is marked in, in slot one, it safely swaps both of those, swap, the, those images. It tries to boot the image itself. So it then goes and boots the image. When that image boots, it's its job to, to mark the bootloader and tell the bootloader that it has successfully booted. If it does not mark to the bootloader that it has successfully booted, the bootloader will swap back to the previous image itself. And so you have a fallback mechanism. Uh, the way this typically works in the field and, and the way I, we've managed devices successfully before is you want to have kind of both options here, right? If you think about how you're doing an upgrade, and I had an upgrade, you know, all, all those millions of devices, you want to push out that upgrade and you want to push it out to a small percentage of your devices first, right? If you think about it, first it's going to a few devices in development, then it's going to, a, you know, 20 devices or 100 devices in QA that you want to test. And throughout that process, you're kind of expecting things to fail horribly, right? <laughs> you know, you, you tested it with just your system here, and it worked great, but then you didn't test it with the 20 other versions of hardware that you were upgrading, and you have some issue. So when you do that, you want to have some way of making sure that the device falls back to the, the working image so you don't have to manually flash all, those, all of those devices. And so what you do is you upgrade the device and you set a fallback. If it doesn't reboot, once it reboots and the network interface has come up and the device has successfully booted, you tell it and you confirm the slot and you say, okay, you have successfully booted uh, and you move on with your life. As you go to rolling this out to larger and larger numbers of devices, you probably don't want to have that confirmation in, in the process because you have high confidence that the device is working well and you potentially have, uh, you know, you don't want to have a scenario where you have 20 million devices you upgrade and half of them are running, running one version or half are running the other. So there what, what you can do is you can basically tell the bootloader to swap and confirm. And this, is, this, this typically depends on your process. In some, for some people, even at the 20 million device scale, you're gonna always wanna swap to the new image and, and directly tell it to confirm that image and, and assume you have some sort of end-to-end -end check. In other scenarios, you're just gonna wanna say, nope, swap and confirm, run the new image. I'd rather you run the new image and take that risk than I would run uh, two incompatible versions in a network. And this was, for example, at SilverSpring, we did large-scale mesh networks. So we had five million devices in contiguous networks with 10,000 devices all meshing for each other. When we did a large-scale upgrade, 
we did not want to have to test compatibility of networking stacks with, <laughs> at that scale uh, with half of the devices running one image and half the devices running another. So we ran uh, our confirmation process up to about 10 or 20,000 devices where we would actually confirm on every device. And then when we pushed it out to the, the full network, we would just switch and confirm. If you're want, running a connected wearable over Bluetooth and the phone is right there, you might always want it to fall back. So it really depends on, on what you want to do. So a little bit about source layout. So I, I mean, the best thing to do with MCU boot is it works uh, on pretty much any platform that Minute supports, as well as m more and more Zephyr platforms, at least the K64F. But I think uh, Linaro has tested it on more. Okay, so, so it runs on, on, on those same platforms on Minute. Uh, it also runs on Zephyr. So if you download Zephyr or Minute, there are instructions in the bootloader for building for, the, for each of those platforms, and so you can actually play around with it. Uh, I'm gonna talk mostly about Minute because that's just what I'm more comfortable with, but you know, Zephyr works equally well, so don't, don't be shy about trying it with Zephyr either. Uh, so if you, if you go and you download Minute, you'll be able to boot the, build the bootloader on every device that Minute runs on, you always have a bootloader. Uh, so the bootloader is located on the Nordic series address zero, and you have to flash the bootloader to the device before you actually have the image. So we always go through the bootloader on the Minute system, so you're able to download it. If you go to the GitHub address in the slide, so github.com slash runtime co slash MCU boot, what you'll see is a number of directories and this is just to give you a little bit of an overview on those directories. So there's apps boot. Apps boot is a sample boot application for Minute. Uh, so it's what the bootloader itself is actually a library that you can compile in and link to specific locations in the core of the bootloader. In Minute, what we do to create our bootloader that runs on most devices is we have an application called apps boot, which simply brings in the bootloader library and defines a main function and calls into the bootloader, and that's pretty much all it does. Um, Zephyr, I think, does something very similar. Uh, there's boot serial support. So we do support uh, serial boot builder upgrades. That is the one exception to the rule when it comes to the application providing the software upgrade. And this is done for a, a lot for maker platforms, actually, was why we originally implemented it. So a lot of maker platforms uh, don't have built-in debugger support but they ship those devices. So this would be, a, an example of this would be some of the Arduinos, uh, as well as the Adafruit has a Feather series, where they, they don't want to spend the extra money on the J-Link chip, or, or their users don't. And so the way they upgrade new software to these devices is over the bootloader. The bootloader is lo located in the right protect sector, and then you can use boot serial to load new firmware onto a device. Uh, you know, typical bootloaders like U-Boot and other bootloaders have support for upgrade within them as well. I think over time, we'd be happy to add Bluetooth support to the bootloader or, or USB or Ethernet or any of those things. It's not really a high priority for us because most of our upgrade paths end up going through uh, the running kernel image itself. But it's something that we certainly welcome as a contribution and can be an optional thing that is compiled into the bootloader. Uh, if you're looking for the core source of the bootloader, that's in boot, boot util. Uh, the, the Zephyr based abstraction, so the way that Zephyr has implemented support for this bootloader is the bootloader itself leverages the Minute APIs when, when running on Minute for accessing the flash and things like that. Uh, so we have a HAL flash API. Uh, what uh, Linaro has done is they've gone ahead and they've created a, a mapping for the HAL flash APIs to Zephyr's driver interfaces. And so when you look at boot Zephyr, that is the Zephyr port of the bootloader. And there are instructions in the bootloader directory that describe how to build the system for Zephyr. Uh, I think Zephyr builds at about the same size as Minute. So the abstraction itself doesn't end up costing a lot of code space. Uh, image tool. So there's two ways of creating signed images that can be downloaded or creating manufacturing images that can be downloaded. You can either use the Newt tool if you're working in the, within the Minute framework. And so that tool is Newt. Uh, there was just a talk on it. Uh, and that tool will allow you to create an image out of a Minute system. It'll allow you to have a version with that image. It'll allow you to sign that image. It'll also allow you to create a manufacturing uh, image, which cont contains the bootloader itself, the super block, uh, 
a default image to run and an empty slot, so a full flash layout that you can load, and that's, in the, that's tied in with the Minute system. Obviously, our goal is to make this bootloader work across all operating system interfaces. So we want Riot to use this. We want this to work with FreeRTOS. It's our goal to make this a bootloader that everybody can use and that we all share effort on. Uh, so having that be the Newt system is probably not uh, the right way of doing that. So we've created a separate tool called Image Tool, which is image signing and generation for the MCU boot project. So if you're using this with other operating systems, you can use that tool. It actually shares source code with the Minute system. So Minute is written in, uh, Minute's package manager is Newt. It's written in Go. In Go, the images, the, the, when you dis distribute uh, a, a product, it's statically linked and compiled. And that works across Windows, Linux, and Mac. So essentially what Image Tool does is it just brings in the same signing and generation libraries that are in Minute. And it uses those to create images in an operating system independent fashion. So there's, there's no downside to using Image Tool, and it'll work on pretty much any platform you run. And then there's Sim, which is a great project done by uh, David Brown from Lenaro, which essentially takes the boot util package from Minute, and it runs it through its paces on Unix and Linux systems. So essentially, it links in the C file uh, that is boot util, which is just a library that is brought into other systems, and it simulates a local flash system and so on every commit, we can actually run the boot, boot util simulator and run through a full set of test cases on the minute bootloader to actually ensure these things work well. Uh, and actually, that was, that was that slide. So I think that we covered all of that. Um, so the Apache minute bootloader is, is fairly, oh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so the Zephyr source abstraction is, uh, it's essentially, so, so for example, with the a, with a bootloader itself, we need some way of accessing Flash, right? Uh, to, to load the images, to erase Flash, to write Flash. Uh, the bootloader itself uses an interface in Minute, which is our HAL, which is HAL Flash. And HAL Flash defines the flashes that are in a system, um, as well as... Um, uh, APIs for accessing and reading those flashes. We have a flash map which defines the, 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 is the super block with the information about what's on the flash and defines access mechanisms for that super block. Those are all minute specific APIs. So what in Boot Zephyr, uh, there are implementations of those minute specific APIs and there's not a ton of them. There's a handful that map into the Zephyr implementations itself. So for example, Je Zephyr has a driver's flash. And so th there's a file there that basically has HAL flash, which is the minute API mappings into Zephyr's mappings. Um, and it doesn't add too much code. It, it, I, as I said, they end up being about the same size. So Zephyr fits pretty much in everything that minute fits in when it comes to these. But it allows us both to use our own underlying hardware implementations. So when you, when you compile MCU boot for the MCU boot system, you pretty much support every system that Zephyr supports. When you compile MCU boot with the Minute system, you pretty much support every system Minute supports. And very similarly, we hope to do the same with Riot and other OSs. So it's a whole layer? It's just a whole layer, yeah. Okay. That was more succinct. Yeah. <laughs> um, yep. So Apache Minute's bootloader is uh, approaching 1.0 now. Uh, so it's been, we've, done, we've been in active development on it for over a year. Uh, that development has died down about uh, three months ago. Um, so the Apache Minute bootloader is still within the Apache Minute project. This is, that is not MCU boot, although we've con maintained compatibility between the two projects. Apache Minute is a project that is independent of runtime. We're obviously big contributors to that project and big supporters but it is, the, it, it is the Apache Minute project's decision as to which bootloader to use. As runtime, though, we've, we've, we've broken out MCU boot. Uh, I think our goal now is to, is to work towards the first release of MCU boot that supports both Zephyr and Minute. And that will be, it, it'll, it will essentially be the Apache Minute bootloader at 1.0 with full Zephyr support. And that's kind of what we consider our starting point, right? Because what we really want is to get everybody collaborating on the same system. And there are definitely features we need to add to this bootloader and improvements we need to make. 
but we want to make them as a community and we want to make them across multiple operating systems. And so the bootloader itself uh, for the platforms it supports is, is very stable. We run, we have probably run hundreds of thousands of upgrades with it uh, reliably on these devices, obviously not one at a time. Um, so it, it, it's fairly stable for where it's run. Uh, but MCU boot does not yet have its first release. We're working towards that very rapidly. I don't think we're about too far off, so I think you should see that within the next three months. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of future work we need to do. Um, so the, the, and we would love, by the way, contributors and people to join in the effort. Uh, we're recruiting you. Uh, please feel free to join. It's an open project. Um, but some of the things we want to do that we haven't done is we, we have no support currently for hardware APIs for a lot of things. Like, so for example, uh, a, a lot of the more modern hardware uh, for secure boot will have multiple keys actually written into the hardware, and those keys are fusible. So if you want to invalidate a key, you can no longer use that key, and that's fusible within the hardware. We don't support any of that. Um, we want to be able to support uh, multi-stage bootloaders. So a, a lot of times what you'll see uh, in devices is you'll have a very, very simple uh, rommable portion of the bootloader, which literally just verifies the portion of the bootloader that gets written to flash. So it will just perform the signing and verification on that, 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 that uh, device. You'll often see this, especially when a bootloader is located in an external flash, as an example. On internal flashes like you have on the Nordic system, it's not that big a deal. But in a lot of cases, one of the, the potential attacks on a bootloader is if you have a flash that's external, if, if the bootloader itself is not signed, even if it's a secure bootloader, somebody can just desolder the flash and solder on a new flash, and then they can ship a invalid product. And the customer has no idea until everything goes wrong. Uh, so having a, a, a section of the bootloader that is rommable that can sign the actual bootloader and then having the bootloader itself, which does the swaps and manages the images, is something that we'd like to do in making, making it very clear what's rommable and what isn't. Um, Support for loading images into RAM, this is a very common one. Uh, so often, you know, one architecture is, and this is the architecture in STMs as well as in uh, Minute in the K64, is that you run directly from Flash and you run at a fixed location in Flash. Another very common architecture is that you have an external spy flash, that's where you locate the image. You have, say, a meg of RAM on the chip itself. You, you, just, you divide that RAM into where you want to run your image and, and what your data and BSSS and heap is. And then you run your image directly out of the RAM on the chip. Uh, we don't support that currently. Uh, we obviously need to add that and will be adding that. And then supporting support for replace instead of swap. Uh, this, has been, this is not a feature we've really seen a lot, but we've, we've definitely heard it from people which is right now we swap the two images so that you can always fall back to the, the replacement image. There, is a, there, has been, there have been requests to essentially just erase the uh, old image and replace the new one on top of it to reduce the complexity of the swap. Uh, that's an option that we're looking at adding and, and supporting. And then the major one, and I think our real, our real goal here, is support for other OSs besides Apache Minute and Zephyr. So we're looking to broaden the support for this bootloader as widely as possible. It's not very hard to do because, you know, there's a, there's a few things that we had to do to get it to work with Zephyr. It was implementing the HAL. It was, uh, and then it was looking at uh, uh, being flexible about where interrupt vectors were located. So in Minute, we located interrupt vectors in RAM uh, because we believe life is too short to have interrupt vectors in text. Uh, Zephyr locates them in text. Uh, and so if you locate the interrupt vectors in text, you need to be able to start the image header offset within the image itself because often interrupt vectors will start at zero or at some fixed location in the image. And so you need to have the image header past the interrupt vectors themselves. So that was some of the work we had to do. We, I imagine there'll be other little things that we have to implement when we go and we add Riot support and FreeRTOS support and all the other OSs. Uh, but our, I think our, our primary goal is really to get as many operating systems supported as possible because I think if we can, it, the goal here is really to drive everybody to share a secure bootloader and share the effort. It's not that much code. It's 12K compiled code uh, for these systems. And it really makes sense to all share efforts on certification and security testing and really just make this a very simple and solid bootloader. So that's going to be where the majority of runtime's efforts are focused 
uh, over the next couple months. Um, and that's pretty much it. So that's, that's the talk uh, about the bootloader. Are there any uh, questions that folks have or, yeah? Uh, well, so there's there, there's a couple things we do. this is uh, it, it's really a configuration option. Um, so there's a couple of layouts that you can have for this. Uh, one is so you just have to size the slots and, and basically size your flash to ensure that you have enough room for growth. So our rule of thumb was we basically when we would select flash, we would basically take double whatever our initial code size estimates were and made sure we had enough flash to do that. Um, in which, and you have to slice, size the slots appropriately. The other option we support uh, in Minute is essentially what we do is we don't have a, a, a concept really of, we have the concept of an application and a kernel. And so what, what we end up doing is slot zero becomes the kernel itself, and it's just the kernel, and then slot one becomes the application. And we end up basically replacing, Essentially what happens is if you want to do a new upgrade, you erase the application, you load the kernel into the application slot, then you copy the, uh, the kernel down into slot zero, and then you upload a new application into slot one, and you can size those appropriately. So those are the options we've, we've supported. Exactly. Well, they're housed and making sure that they boot appropriately, right? So just going through and making sure on a regular basis that we test to make sure that we are booting Zephyr, I mean, booting Riot on every platform that, that Riot boots on, and similarly for Zephyr, right? Trying to get the, some alignment there. Uh, there is an effort that we're looking to start that's separate from this, which is to share efforts also on the software upgrade schemes themselves. We think that that should be a separate project from the bootloader. Uh, it, because we think it should be a part of the running kernel itself and that there's going to be some diversity there, right? For Bluetooth, the way you do upgrade, or the way we do upgrades for Bluetooth is over OIC, which is IOTivity. Um, and then we have a CBOR based upgrade protocol that runs over Bluetooth. When you're running in a Wi-Fi scenario, you're probably, you're behind a NAT and you're probably going to want to dial into the cloud and talk to the cloud. So the upgrade protocol and the software that it does upgrades is going to change based upon the transports and the application. Uh, the bootloader should remain the same for all of those. Uh, so we are looking at a separate effort, which is to, to, at least for Bluetooth, all converge on an upgrade scheme and start those, but those won't be part of the MCU boot project. There's a standard interface. There's basically a flash interface that you have to tell the bootloader to, to boot to a new image or to do something. You, there's a few set of TLVs that you have to basically put it through its paces. And so that'll be standardized for whatever software upgrade protocol you end up using. Uh, I saw a hand over there. Are you just answering the question? You mentioned passing away over OIC earlier. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. could, could you just go over again the, the secure side, the, the traceable security? Yep. Yeah. Um. Sure. Uh, so uh, basically, every image is signed. Uh, so the, the way. Uh, typically a secure boot scheme works is that you have a private key that you as a company will keep very secret. Uh, we, I think, uh, used HSMs to uh, sign our firmware images. Uh, the actual key material itself was printed on paper and put in like 30 different locations and you all had to take it back together and it was, it was painful. And we actually, these HSMs also give you policies, right? So what you can do is you can require that a product manager, an engineer, and a QA person all have to like, you know, give their thumbprint and sign away their firstborn to sign every fir firmware image. So those images get signed with the private key which you keep as a developer or as a company uh, very safe. On every single device that gets manufactured, you put the public comp component of that private key. And so what the bootloader does is when it comes up and it ver looks to, at the image to boot, it goes through and it computes a SHA-256 of the image, which is what actually gets signed uh, by the tool. And then it uses the public key to verify that the private component of that image gets booted. And so that's how you ensure that the image you're booting 
is an authentic image that you should have booted. So where would the public key be stored? The public key is, uh, as I mentioned, it it's up to you. It could, it could be stored on your laptop. I wouldn't recommend it. The, the public key or the private key? Um, the, the, I guess the private key that you're using to sign the... Um... The private key you're using to sign the image is, is stored by the, the company that's signing it. So when you create a downloadable software image, you uh, have that private key. Uh, we, at, at SilverSpring, we... Do new create image and you provide it with the private key or you provide it with the address of an HSM that can perform the signing operation. Right. So on the public key then, when it's coming in yep. to Yes. So that's, uh, that's stored uh, right at the end of the bootloader itself. So it's in, yeah, it's in the right protect portion of the flash itself. So it's in, it's in the create the bootloader. Exactly. That's where you're doing it. Yep. Well, you can locate it anywhere you want in flash. Um, Typically, you would locate it within the right protect portion of your flash. But since you're looking at a standard, yep. that's where you want to obtain. put that image as well. So we, we, we locate it at the end of the bootloader. Um, is the bootloader also signed? The bootloader itself is not signed today. Uh, that would be the thing that we would need to do to make it rombable. Right, so, so essentially when you have a rombable bootloader, what you want to have is you want to have some portion that's located within the chip itself uh, that is preloaded and rommed in the chip. That comes out, you have a signed bootloader or a signed image, and that gets, that gets verified by the rommed portion of, portion of the chip, but that has no complexity beyond, signing that, beyond verifying the signature of the bootloader itself. Then the bootloader boots up and, and, and it goes and it operates the upgrade. Exactly, and, and and typically there's you know there those are managed uh, by the chip vendors themselves. So when you start to do kind of higher volume manufacturing, you can actually work for with the chip vendors to provide custom ROM masks for your security certificates. Uh, I, well, so we want to get down. I mean, we have to kind of. Uh, at least from a runtime perspective, uh, support 16K of RAM and 128K of flash. Uh, I think, you know, if you look at kind of MCUs that are out there, that's the bottom limit uh, for most of them. You certainly have smaller ones. Uh, I think 8K of RAM would be fine as well. Uh, we typically don't see many MCUs below that uh, these days. Um, flash size, you said 128. It's, it's rare, I mean, you will see 32K of flash on some of these devices. Um, it's very rare. Uh, it would probably work on those devices, but although I don't think it would be very useful. Um, yeah, exactly, right. Because <laughs> uh, we're, we're, we're now 12K of that uh, for the bootloader, and then how big is your image actually, and, and, and do you want it to be secure? Uh, so I, I think for us, kind of where we're targeting is eight, 8 to 16K of RAM, and I think 8 is fine, uh, but 128K of flash, which is what you see on most chips today, uh, even the previous generation chips. Uh, and then on the upper end, uh, sky is the limit, but I, I'd say it'd be rare to find anything beyond 128 megs of flash. Because typically at that point, people run Linux. You, I mean, you do see spy flashes that get up to 256 mags just because there's a cost point that the chips are hitting. So, but it doesn't really matter. I mean, we have enough uh, address space for all of those chips. Yep. So it's just one other thing. This, uh, since you're looking at a standard yep. rolling it out there, the, the, is the super block going to be some sort of managed somewhere? Is the way that that's defined? Yes. So we, there is a documentation uh, on the image format itself as well as on the super block format that's maintained as part of the project. Um, and all of that is, everything is documented within the project and maintained as a part of the project. And we want to you know, grow that and, and, and really have both the specification of the flash layout and of the super block and, and the bootloader and how that works 
tied in with the bootloader itself. So that will have to be ownership between what's going on within CU Block and MindU? And, and Zephyr and all of the projects. I think it, it really benefits us all to just agree on the Flash format itself and have a consistent way of understanding how the Flash has been programmed. Uh, and, and starting at the bootloader just seems like a good place to do that. Uh, one sector of Flash. Yeah, so it, it depends what your sector ends up being. Uh, so if you have 2K sectors, 2K, if 8K sectors, 8K. Um, but it has to be, well, or rather, it has to be the size of the largest sector that you're going to erase within the slots themselves. Yep. Uh, can you define more than just two slots? Uh, today, no, but that would be certainly something that's easy to add to the project and we'd be happy to add. Oh, you can certainly define more than, oh, sorry. These are just image slots. Okay. Yeah, so the flash map itself, you can define areas that are for file systems. So we have a, in Minute, we have a file system, which is a log structure file system called NFFS. Uh, so you can say, I want this area to be for NFFS. We have a configuration variable storage mechanism as well that are, is just purely TLV config variables. And you can define those as, a, as an additional one. Uh, these are just the image slots. So there's a bunch of other flash that is defined there as well. Uh, any other questions? Awesome. Well, uh, on that note, thank you very much. And <laughs> cheers.